We are here today to discuss Padre Pio of, of Petrolcina, mm -hmm. but, but you yourself, um, you know, being a Capuchin, have a heritage with Padre Pio and a shared commitment. Could you tell us a little bit about your own pilgrimage to San Giovanni uh, Rotondo? Well, I was in Italy back in the probably 85, 84, 85, and they give the opportunity to Capuchins, and they do it by language groups, to go over to Italy, and we spent five weeks studying uh, Franciscan spirituality. We spent two weeks in Assisi, uh, a week in Rome. We were meeting other Capuchins from around the world, and one of our trips was to St. Giovanni Rotondo, where Padre Pio was buried, and where his hospital is, and where we have a friary up in the mountain regions. It must be very beautiful there, of course, in it's, the mountains. It's very beautiful in the mountain, and, and there's water nearby, and it's just a very picturesque mountain town. And even though you have a large hospital and millions of pilgrims going there, there's, there's a feeling of a small town atmosphere where everyone knows one another, everyone is very outgoing. But Padre Pio built his hospital there for the relief of suffering. And since his death in 1968, the hospital has tripled in size and is probably one of the best hospitals in Europe in treating people who are suffering with various illnesses. Now, one of the most extraordinary things on my own end is to see you know, all of these pilgrims, thousands, maybe mm -hmm. millions, and yet it begins with this humble, you know, Francis Forgione. Um, I forget exactly, you know, when he entered the Ferrari, but he clearly lived through some of the greatest calamities of the 20th century. Correct. The First and Second World War. He had extraordinary battles with the devil. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have stories of what seems to be grave spiritual warfare, all in this picturesque little and small town. Um, right. So... Did you hear about any of those um, those aspects of spiritual warfare in the life of, of Padre Pio? Oh, yeah. If, if you reflect, Padre Pio was born in 1887, and he was born into poverty. Uh, his house was just one room, 34 uh, feet wide, and had just one window, a dirt floor. So he came from very humble, very basic uh, background, and they were farmers. And uh, he was not a healthy child. Uh, he had digestive problems and eating, which he suffered throughout his life. And he also had problems with a lot of headaches, and he tired very easily. And again, like many other people like Father Solanus, his education lacked because he had to go out into the fields as a young child to work. But this came back that when he entered the Capuchins and when he became a priest, one of the first things he did as a priest was to go out to the fields and he would teach the people, the, the peasants, how to read and to write and come to the knowledge of their faith. So he, he was hoping to give education to everyone, but he knew what it was like to miss his education as a young child. So he actually went out into the fields and would spend his afternoons teaching uh, the poor in the fields how to read and to write and to understand their faith. Now, I know that this, the Stigmata only appeared later, later on in his life, right? I mean, he was like yeah. 30? Well, basically, he entered in 1903, and when he became a Capuchin, because he was sick, they kept sending him, and that's where he sent coming to St. Uh, Giovanni Rotondo, because he, the mountain air would be better for him, his cl the climate would be easier for him, and so they sent him into this obscured little village up in the mountains, and for the most part, um, he wanted a quiet, private life. He prayed for the stigmata, that he would be embrace the uh, stigmata. Now, one fact that I read about recently is that in the 2,000 years of church history, only 70 people have received the stigmata. Padre Pio is the very first priest to receive the stigmata. Interesting. Which he received in 1918. And Padre Pio was praying that he would receive the stigmata, but that the wounds would not show. Like Catherine of Siena. He wanted to suffer and embrace the suffering of the cross and Christ for the salvation of souls, but he didn't want it to show. Well, it did show. And when it did show up, it took him about a month of hiding it. But the friars and were realizing that he was stumbling and he was 
not moving about the friary as, as he normally did. So the superiors called in and said, what's going on? What's happening? And so it was at this time that he undid his hands and his feet and showed that he had received the wounds of Christ. And of course, one of the most amazing aspects about this is he was embarrassed. It wasn't like he was trying to publicize oh, this Oh no, at that, all. Was, that was where he had prayed to receive and receive the suffering. And, and like any wounds of Christ, uh, the pain, the bleeding, uh, the, con the muscle damage, everything that you would have if you had the actual wounds, which he did, it wasn't something that he just suffered on a certain day. It was something that he suffered every day, every minute of his life. But he wanted it private. So of course, when they found out, they called the superiors in Rome and the superior general of the Capuchins came to see him and to investigate. And there was long investigations and doctors. And this was not something that uh, Padre Pio wanted. He wanted a private life where he could hear confession, bring people to, to God, work with the poor and the suffering, but he didn't want a publicity. He hated to have his photograph taken. Interesting. So the, the, the photos we do have of him, were they taken under duress then? Or At from some of the early years, yes. Uh, he was put basically under what you would call house arrest. Mm. Uh, there was a time period between 1924 and 1937 that um, they were questioning what was going on. Was it something that was self-inflicted, these wounds? Um, when he did believe there was a sense of roses, a sense of smell, and they were wanting to know, is this coming from God or is this coming, is it man-made? So he was put under basically house arrest from those years because they were investigating. And again, there's a little bit of jealousy involved. One bishop came and said, I want you to show me the wounds. And he said, no, I, I'm not going to show you the wounds. He didn't want to be publicized. So the bishop went back and gave a, an unfavorable review, saying this is probably all made up. It's probably not real and so forth. So there's a lot of trials throughout his life that people questioned, was this for real? And I heard uh, somewhere the Pope even <laughs> banned him from saying Mass at one point. Right. During true? those years that he was under house arrest, he could say mass, but he could not say a public mass. He could not hear confessions. He could, anything he wrote had to be reviewed. Because when you have something like this, which is extremely extraordinary, you have a tendency to draw people who are not, they're a little fanatical. Yeah. And so he was still at that time trying to keep it a hidden aspect. And the way the word got out was people, in a sense, who got these photographs, these people who got some letters, they're the ones who went out to the world and publicized it. He was more interested in accepting the wounds of Christ and suffering in private and doing what he could in his local area. But it became both a national and an international through our people coming from all over the world to meet him, to go to confession to him, uh, and just be part of that experience. Now, one of the interesting narratives I keep on hearing from the previous generations are soldiers from the Second World War. Right. They would stop by and, and you know have confession with Padre Pio. And I've heard stories where, despite the fact he only knew Italian from his birth, he <coughs> was given the gift of, of multiple tongues. He was able to speak in French and English. Um, in some cases, we have stories of bilocation. And right. some of them are very well documented, which is interesting too. We're not talking about hearsay. People who personally met with Pio, sat down with him. Um, can you speak to any stories which you've heard of personally or have had well, direct contact with? There was, during the war years, a lot of the military who were in Europe heard of Padre Pio. And of course, these were frightening times in the world. World right. War II was a world war, and it was very devastating to go through this. Well, two friars, two friars, two soldiers decided to go see Padre Pio. One a little bit reluctant. You know, he didn't know Padre Pio. He was a lay person. He was from New York. And he went with his friend, and this soldier went up to Padre Pio and said, you know, am I being called to the priesthood? Can you tell me what's going to happen to me? Am I being called to the priesthood? Padre Pio was very, looked at him, and he said, no, you're not being called to the priesthood but the soldier that you came with, bring him over here. He's going to become a priest. And Father Donan Hickey was that person 
who, after the war, came back and became a Capuchin, and he spent most of his life in Guam. And he was a missionary to Guam and the islands of the Mariana Islands, and he's buried here in Yonkers. But he was a person who wasn't going to find out his calling in life. He had, was not really seriously considering the priesthood. But Padre Pio was able to look at him and say, you are going to become a priest. God is calling you to priesthood. And the other soldier who wanted that call, Padre Pio knew to say, no, you're not going to be called to the priesthood, but you will be called to embrace a life of family life and so forth. So Solanus, like most of the saints, could read the, pe the minds of the hearts, not so much the minds, but the hearts, and could tell people what was going to happen to them in the future. And I heard a similar story about uh, Pope John Paul II, as Carl Wojtyla, uh, uh, some story where he traveled and met with Padre Pio and was told, someday you will wear white. Is that story true? I don't know that particular one. I mean, there's a lot of stories through the different saints. You have St. Bernadette Subaru, who in revealing her secrets to the Pope, one of them is that a bishop dressed in white would be shot. Right. And so each Pope who read that since Bernadette Subaru was there, they didn't know if they were the one who would be shot at, and they didn't know the outcome. Of course, we know it was Pope John Paul II who was the one that was shot. And the bullet that he received in that womb was brought back to Lourdes and is placed in the crown of the uh, Blessed Mother's crown in Lourdes, France, as a, as a token of thanksgiving that he survived the assassination attempt. And of course, there's those who would like to tie that into the third secret of Fatima, which <clears throat> right. of course you know, is, is the ongoing topic of discussion and, and of debate. But uh, another question too is I heard um, of many cases, once again, of, of the diabolic and Padre Bio being personally attacked. Right, um, no, that would be documented and true, that he had battles you know, with what he would say, the devil or the evil one, because if you have a very holy, saintly person, there's always that push on the part of evil to make that person, you know, look bad. And that's where Padre Pio was constantly under investigation because one person would question the wounds that he received. Uh, when he was building the hospital, that where were the funds coming from? Were they coming from the mob? Were they coming from undercover um, organizations? And was this not so much an act of good, but an act of evil? And at one point, after another investigation, they basically, Padre Pio and the friars had to sign over the friary and the hospital over to the Vatican and let go of control. And that he did. But he had those bouts where the devil would tempt him because when you have so many people coming to you and praising you, saying, oh, you're a saint, you've helped me, you've healed me, like most people, like Solanus Casey, Padre Pio would say, I didn't heal you. What I did was I prayed to God for you. God healed you. You go to God to give thanks for the healing. The healing is not from me. But you can feel the devil pushing at different times how people would push him to saying, well, you've done this. You're responsible for the healing. You're responsible for the hospital being built. And that is a, a, a way that, you know, evil and the devil works into one's life, that uh, you're doing it. It's not coming from God. It's coming from you. And Padre Pio and all the other saints have always said, it's God working through me. But it is not my work. It's God's work. For me, that's beyond fascinating because often we speak of spiritual warfare in terms of exorcism. We speak right. of diabolic oppression. Well, Rarely do we discuss it in terms of the personal, in terms mm -hmm. of those very s small and subtle ways right. of taking responsibility right. versus the lack of responsibility and realizing the gifts and graces from God. Mm -hmm. um, was Pio ever involved in a formal exorcism? I do. I can't really say. Some people have said yes, other people have said no. But he had struggles because... You know, people could see the good that Pio was doing in his life, both for the hospital and for the healings and the years of hearing confessions and bringing people back to God. And that um, there was a pull on, on evil to bring him down 
and to show that he was false and that what he was teaching and what he was doing was not good, but there was some form of evil involved in all this. And that's where the church would always question. That's why they're very slow to canonize an individual because is it coming from God? Is it coming from someone being eccentric or unusual? It's, it's a whole question of, um, you know, over a long period of time, you know, to weed out what's happening and where is it coming from. And all things basic, if it's, if it's good, it's coming from God, you know. But people have a way of trying to change that around. We had a, there was a man who came to confession to Padre Pio. He's a mobster and well known. And he came to Padre Pio and unusual for most Capuchins, but Padre Pio threw him out of the confessional yeah. and very abrupt with him. And people question, why did he do it? Was it because he was a mobster? Was he, you know, un undercover? The question for Padre Pio, he didn't come to confession in sincerity. He was just testing Padre Pio to see, did he know my past? And Padre Pio, basically, people believe, said was, you're a married man and you have a mistress. And now you come to me and you're playing games with me. And Padre Pio was not one to play games. If you wish to come and go to confession to me and restore your faith in the church and in God, fine. But don't come here and test me. And that could be another way of people were constantly testing him as far as what he said and what he did and try to trip him up. Very much like Jesus when they came and right. they said, well, um, you know, we have Roman occupation here. And so who should we pay taxes to? And the high priest and the smarter people were there and Jesus, and they were pressing him to answer the question. And Jesus looked up and after drawing on the, in the sand and said, well, give to God what is God and give to man what is man. And he held up a coin of Caesar and said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God. So there's always that constant conflict that people are trying to say, is it real? Is Padre Pio authentic? Is he sincere? Is what he's doing according to the church teachings and the traditions of the church? And that can be evil to wear on a person's soul, you know, okay. because people are constantly complimenting you people. that He would receive probably 600 letters and 80 telegrams per day, which he couldn't address. So he had to have Fry's help him that out. And they would just, you know, take the primary pieces that they felt he needed to read and respond to. But people can pump your ego up very much. And so there was always that push on the part of some people to try to disprove who Padre Pio was and what he was all about. Reminds me of Genesis chapter 3 with, of course, the serpent, right? Mm -hmm. Yea, hath God said, you know, in the day where you taste of this forbidden fruit, you will be as gods, knowing both good and evil. Well, mm -hmm. Of course, we know that's the age-old lie. Right. Um, what I find interesting is the going back to the basics aspect mm -hmm. of Peter, where he he's this mystical, almost um, you know ancient character up in the mountains, mm -hmm. lost in fog and in mystery. And I think we can often forget, you know, he died as late as the, the '60s. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. he is the same very much for our time and for our memory. Right. And I was wondering, are you aware of any comments he had about, of course? The, the chastisements in the future or any warnings or any message which he was trying to impart to those who would be surviving the Cold War and surviving the post-Cold War era. Mm -hmm. What kind of lessons do you think Pio is leaving for us right now as we're facing the struggles of our time? Well, Pio you know, had experienced all of the, you know, the wars in Europe. Again, you said a lot of the soldiers came to him to seek his help, his protection. Uh, the, the misery of the people of, Is, uh, of Italy, that you know, they were being devastated by the wars. And he, he was saying the same thing that the saints have said through the ages with all the different battles. That, you know, battles will come and go, and they're trying of people's souls, but that you have to continually trust in God, have confidence in Him, have faith, that we will make it through the war, that we'll make it through these hard times that God has not abandoned you. A lot of people who go through the wartime areas, the, after World War II, the friaries and the monasteries and the convents were packed 
because people went to war and saw the horrors of war. And Padre Pio was basically saying what all of the great religious leaders of the world through the centuries have said, is that God will remain with his people and to have faith that we'll get through this and that with God, all things are possible. In some ways, he reminds me of a lot of Old Testament prophet figures like Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Zechariah, where, you know, at the time of the nation's crisis, mm -hmm. you know, of uh, Israel's crisis, you know, the prophet would be basically there first haranguing, you know, the troubles of the time, but also too promising that even in the middle of exile, even in the middle of Babylon, mm -hmm. God is not going to forsake you. You know, his rod and his staff shall comfort you. He's anointed right. your head with oil. Now, of course, now we're speaking not only on the level of Israel, but of, of course now of the church, of the ecclesia. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is the role of these saints, but particularly Pio, as a similar vehicle for that. I, maybe I'm wrong to see continuity there, but mm -hmm. I, I always sit back and I wonder, wow, like he's the modern contemporary version of Samuel in the mm -hmm. book of Samuel or of Nathan, you know, when he's going to King David and, you know, trying to talk to him about Bathsheba. It's very mm -hmm. similar to what you're describing with the, the mobster in mm -hmm. some ways. The more it changes, the more it remains the same. The struggles of man, their relationship with God. Saints have come throughout the ages and the message is still the same that not to fall away from, you know, the whole ideal of their faith and to stay strong. And Pio was a man of his time. And where Solanus and Brother Andre of Montreal, they were porters and people came to them and he br they brought people back to God. Padre Pio was unique that he brought people back to God through the confessions. And we're celebrating divine mercy and forgiveness. And so this is something that is real today as it was when Padre Pio was alive and hearing, they projected he probably heard about two million confessions in his lifetime, in the 52 years that he heard confessions, and that it was a way that Padre Pio used to bring people back to their faith and their confidence in God. And it was his way of dealing with instilling their faith, which had kind of gone out because of the wars, because of the, you know, the just everyday difficulties, not just of the battles, but people had lack of food, they had lack of work, they had to move not knowing where the troops were coming and going. The troops were nervous, the people were nervous, so there was a lot of unsettlement. And Padre Pio, when they would go to confession to him, would not only bring them back to the faith and strengthen their faith, but comforted them that he says, I'm here for those who suffer and who are in need. And he used his suffering of the stigma that he received by being available to people. Well, you know, we here in the United States often find it hard to relate to a country in the middle of wartime where your village is flying one morning, the sun is shining, you know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a blue clear day and all of a sudden you see walking through the tall trees in the distance, this enemy army coming through right. and they leave only rags and desolation and a mountain of ashes. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, we all experience on some level wars in our own lives, whether they're, you know, for me and my blindness, uh, for some, they, they carry other crosses. And right. what's amazing about Pio, which is unique, is by carrying the stigmata, he seems to have shown to us the idea of redemptive suffering, mm -hmm. the idea that you can consecrate your suffering to God mm -hmm. and make of it um, an example of, of peace and of love and maybe offer up in reparation for the sins of the world, right. you know, those troubles which are at hand, is that somehow tied in with his message of pray, hope, and don't worry, perhaps? It is, because he, he, wanted, he wanted to embrace the suffering, so he received the stigmata, which was a daily pain and agony for him. And he was doing it for the, you know, for the salvation of souls. But he was also helping people who were struggling individually with their own personal struggles, whether blindness, through family problems, finances, fears, agonies. He helped them to embrace their fears, to say that they're not alone in their fears, that God is always present to them. God is always with them. And that by themselves, they can become discouraged and disillusioned. And that if you, if you put your trust in God and have confidence in what he promises, then you can make it through the journey. 
and Padre Pio used his suffering. And I remember one person reading and they said, I was an atheist, I didn't believe in God. And he said, I went to hear Padre Pio because I was curious. I, I, went, I was skeptical, I wanted to see for myself. And just in attending that mass, that one individual came to say, I felt like I was watching Christ on the cross. I could see that it was real, that the wounds were real, real, but that I could see Padre Pio suffering, as he said, mass because of the agony that he carried in his body. And not just for a day or not for a couple of months, but throughout his, most of his life, he carried those wounds. And he said he went away confident that God was aware of our suffering and our pain and that he would help us. And so he became a believer. Well, one of the tidbits I was researching yesterday out of personal interest is um, the word Gethsemane, which means, of course, oil press. And we know from the Passion narratives, you know, where does the suffering of Christ really begin? Mm -hmm. Well, right after, you know, the Last Supper, after the consecration of the Eucharist, mm -hmm. he goes, you know, and suffers in Gethsemane where all the sins of the world seem to already be piling on him. He's, right. he's you know, he's literally sweating blood, uh, I think, according to the Gospel of Luke. Right. And what I find interesting about that kind of a passage is I look at someone like a Pew or Francis of, of Assisi or even a Father Solanus, and you can tell it's almost like they are being crushed mm -hmm. in some aspects by the sins of the world. And yet at the same time, they are a joyful oblation. Right. And they know that what they're doing is still bringing peace. So when you're describing him in mass, I can almost picture, you know, him bleeding, him trembling, him in agony. At the same time, the same kind of intrinsic joy, the surprised by joy aspect mm -hmm. of, of his existence. And that dissidence, I think, has always been with us from the foot of the cross to the first Easter. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that when he was in the Agon, he said, you know, take this cup from me, but let your will be done, not mine. And it wasn't only in that, but he was suffering when he tried to bring his message to the people and the high priests and the people who didn't believe in Jesus and what he was saying and that this healing was false and this is not right. And they were constantly trying to entrap Jesus in his words and his actions. That was another form of suffering that so many people forget at times. That here he was, he came on earth to show himself to his people and not just at the crucifixion, but at other times, people kept rejecting his word. In the Gospel of John, uh, there is that whole discussion about the idea of the Father, right? And Christ is speaking of his Heavenly Father, the first person of the Trinity. And he's essentially saying, you know, you neither know me nor my Father, for mm -hmm. if you knew him, you would accept me. Mm -hmm. You know, another comes in his own name and you accept him, but I come in my Father's name. What's funny is they, they make jabs and saying, we know who our father is. Mm -hmm. And I often wonder whether that jab is, is a reference to, um, of course, the, the nativity passages. People were probably whispering in Nazareth and in Bethlehem, of course, about the virgin birth and right. questioning and already mm -hmm. crying. I, I can only imagine the level of insults which may have been hurled at the Holy Family by neighboring villages, by their right. own you know, right. by those close to us. And, you know, obviously, you know, Christ and Mary are both without sin. We know this dogmatically through the faith and through the catechism. But I can imagine, you know, others in the innermost circle feeling very hurt by this, you know, mm -hmm. and, and a great sense of, of worry. And yet the dignity with which the Holy Family carried themselves in the earliest apostles. I just, I find some echoes in our description of Padre Pio there. But do you think I'm you know, on, on base there, or is that a correct uh, assessment? Yes, I would say it is because, you know, Padre Pio, who wanted to remain obscured in the mountains and to live his life and to embrace the suffering of the supposedly hidden wounds of Christ, and God reveals that he, they're visible, and as of that day, he no longer has a private life. And the people constantly, some people always questioning you know, is this true? Is it not true? People questioning his faith. St. Joseph, when he took Mary, was ready to divorce her quietly, according to the scriptures, saying, you know, well, you know, I'm, I know I'm not the father, and so let me quietly, you know, uh, divorce her quietly. 
and yet he had the dream and saying, have no fear in taking Mary as your wife. And so even though this Padre Pio had to deal with a lot of insults and questions and misgivings on what was happening in his life, he left it in God's hands and just said, this is who I am and this is you know, my mission. And if people didn't believe it, and it went to the Pope, went to cardinals, investigations, they went to medical doctors. He had to constantly, in a sense, show people that this was not something that was man-made. It was something that came from God. What I find striking about this is, in some cases, the, the great similarities between him and Francis of the CC. They both share the name Francis. They, right. You know, they both are Italian. They, they share the same nationality, although, of course, back in, uh, you know, St. Francis of Assisi's day was very different in mm. boring states. Mm. And they're both dedicated to radical poverty mm -hmm. and, and a sense of obedience to the will of God, and they're both stigmatists. And yet, nevertheless, Padre Pio asserts his own originality in some ways because it seems to me where St. Francis was trying to clearly reform the monastic systems of the day to create a new order, right? Mm -hmm. um, with Padre Pio, he seems to have focused on penance. Mm -hmm. That seems to have been the chief focus, where the idea of washing yourself clean in the gift of the sacrament. I I've heard some exorcists like to say that if you look at the confessional, that can often be more powerful than many prayers of deliverance because the confessional is a sacrament, mm -hmm. whereas exorcism or even a blessing is only a sacramental. And of course the sacraments, you know, they convey grace. We know this, you know, through the catechism, through scripture. It's interesting to me that Pio, who suffered so much from the diabolic and yet was clearly in the communion of saints, emphasized this sacrament. And there seems to have been a link there supernaturally. Mm -hmm. But I've been, I haven't been able to uh, riddle out anything else in there. Do you have any observations of your own? Uh, not too many. Basically, the confessional was his way of bringing people back to God. And in the case of Father Solanus, they felt, well, they never gave him permission because he'd be too scandalized to hear the sins of the people. Where Padre Pio was someone who listened to confessions for 14, 16 hours a day. Wow. And that in itself is a penance to listen constantly to how people have gone against the teachings of the church, how they've questioned their faith in God. And he had to be strong and not for a week in telling people always to remain positive. You could get a little discouraged hearing sin after sin after all these years. And yet Padre Pio remained positive and said, this is a beautiful thing. Going to confession should not be a thing where he would give them penances you know, for their sins and acts of kindness but that he wanted them to not leave on a negative side, but that they'd experienced the sacrament of reconciliation. Back then it was, well, we say confession, reconciliation, but the church uses the word reconciliation. You're being reconciled between yourself and God and your neighbor. And this is not a time of like beating yourself up. I'm sure a lot of people who went to confession had been beating themselves up for years, carrying these sins and not feeling right with it but he released them and let them know that God loved them and that these sins were forgiven. And sometimes people have to hear that. And Padre Pio has to constantly tell people, turn back to God, your sins are forgiven. Sometimes we need to physically hear that. And some of these you know, were very difficult situations and yet Padre Pio remained positive in hearing these confessions day after day, hour after hour. I would become probably very frustrated in the fact that you're, you're hearing probably the same sins and the same scenarios and you become frustrated, but Padre Pio, kept, Padre Pio kept it very upbeat and he didn't like to play games with people. You know, I'm here to help you if you don't want your help, there are other people who need help. It wasn't that he wasn't compassionate to him, but people would come and test him because they knew that he, they could read his heart. They, he could read their hearts and their minds and their souls like other saints and great mystics could. So he didn't want them to play games. He wanted them to say, this is an opportunity to reconcile yourself with God. Obviously, one of the aspects of Padre Pio which compels me is 
his concept of the rosary as the weapon, as the, of course, the sword which one can wield in spiritual warfare for one's protection, for one's family. And obviously that leads many comparisons with Patrick Payton. You know, I, I was wondering if you knew anything more about um, P or, or Payton's theology of the rosary, their understanding of the way we can use this humble string of beads um, to engage closer with our Lord and with our Lady. Well, again, the rosary is something that's been around for a very long time. And throughout the years, it's a form of simple prayer, because you have to remember through the centuries, the people were not educated, but these were simple prayers to the Blessed Mother. And again, they have the old saying, if you want something from Jesus, go to his mother. Uh -huh. And like the wedding feast of Cana, where, you know, like, woman, why are you coming to me at this, that there's not enough wine? And so it was a way, the rosary is a way, as you say, a weapon that allows people to pray to the Blessed Mother as an intercessor to her son to help them in the daily battle. It doesn't have to be a one-time battle. Life is a battle. We're on a battlefield. And that the rosary has helped people throughout the year, as Padre Pio has encouraged, that it, it acts as a form of meditation to refocus where you are with God, your relationship with God, but also your relationship with people, your neighbors. And uh, the basic scriptures come down to love of God and love of neighbor. And the rosary has helped people throughout the years to use that as a, an instrument of peace, of reconciliation, and is turning to Mary and saying these prayers over and over again, saying intercede for me and intercede for those who I love. I am always reminded of among the last words of Padre Pio, him clutching his rosary and saying, Jesu Maria, mm -hmm. many times. And oh, yeah. I, I often wonder in those last couple of moments, you know, I, I know he probably was in that bedroom which he was best known for with the picture of Our Lady up on the wall. Mm -hmm. If he was, you know, looking into her eyes and finding yeah. consolation and comfort there at right. the very end. No, when he died, he was uttering very simple phrases, you know, like, my God, my all, Oh, Holy Mother, pray for me, you know, pray for the world. I mean, when you get down to a person approaching their death, they don't go into these very long renditions of prayers and so forth. It goes, it turns to a very basic uh, understanding, like Father Solanus, when he lifted himself for the last time and said, I give my soul to Jesus Christ, is simple phrases that summarize the person's life. Solanus gave his all as a Capuchin. Padre Pio gave his all both through the physical suffering, but the mental anguish of people not believing what was happening to him in his life and what he was meant to do is to bring people back to God through the sacrament of confession and a sense of mercy, God's divine mercy, divine mercy. And yet, you know, these are the pieces that um, when you're near your death, you go very much back to your basic belief. And his was belief in God, help of the Blessed Mother, and that he's not alone in his struggle. The saints will help him. His mother was very strong on her love for St. Francis of Assisi. She named him Francisco. And it was just understandable that when he was like maybe 14 years old, he told his mother, I wish to become a Capuchin. And as much as she loved her son, she said, this is God's will, and I'm happy for you. I hate to see you leave, but you must follow what God wants of you. And so again, the mother-son relationship comes in. And those echoes, I, I clearly see in someone like a Solanus who also had a love of Our Lady. Right. You know, and, and of course, there's that story which you told me of the very, very ill woman uh, who was unable to see Father Solanus, and Solanus was able to hand a rosary over for her mm -hmm. and place the rosary on her on her body, which was withered and mm -hmm. she was healed. Mm -hmm. um, and I often think just the mere touch of those beads was able to, you know, of course, in the full knowledge of what this means, bring rest and healing and restitution. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's throughout history that great holy people have used the rosary, have used the sacraments, to bring people back to God because people are always lured away 
from their faith by what's happening in the world. If it's war, it's they're discouraged and you know everything is going to pot. Or even doubt. I mean, there's a great um, story where there's a woman who didn't believe in hell, going to Padre mm-hmm. Pia, right? And Padre Pia is responsible. You'll believe it when you get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very blunt, you know, very to the point kind of sense of humor. And, and I think it's, isn't that great? We have, we have the same, we know how to laugh, but also to be very direct and be very serious. Yeah. Uh, no, Padre Pio knew as many confessions as he heard, he did not want to waste time. He wanted to save souls. He wanted to bring people to salvation. And when people came with very, in a sense, stupid questions and requests and ways of tricking him up as they did, you know, they tried right. with the high priest and Jesus, he was very blunt and very direct saying, if you wish to go to confession, then let's go to confession. But if you're here to question uh, my wounds, or if you're here to question my motives, I don't have time for this. And he would throw them out of the confessional. And I guess that's true for anyone who wants to investigate Padre Pio. You know, if you want to, um, you know, find excuses not to believe, you will always find excuses not to believe. Right. If, you, if you're looking for the truth sincerely, and you are looking for God's miracles and God's love, you are going to find what you are looking for. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, I often think uh, any search for one's future is, is kind of like someone steering a great ship in, into this vast ocean. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we have assistance. Grace is helping us along the way. Mm-hmm. You know, but nevertheless, it's you know, we are given the free agency, of course, to choose. And Pew is an amazing role model and example for me. I've chosen to investigate his life and to, to research and to study because, first of all, you know, my grandfather, Jack Brennan, as you know, had a great devotion mm-hmm. to you. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to have many sacramentals in and around the home where I will pray in front of third class relics dedicated to him, which he personally held and had used. But also, too, in the acknowledgement that that saga is far from over, you know. Mm-hmm. At Sacred Heart, there are, you know, in many ways, individuals like yourself who are dedicated to not only the principle of the Capuchin life, but are making it clear. And and us as the laity, um, just to conclude, is there any particular message for the laity um, and for for Catholics involved in other forms of ministry, which uh, Pio leaves for us today? Well, I think Pio's message back then is as strong as it is for today. I mean, today we celebrate Divine Mercy with Sister Festina. Yes. And Padre Pio, Solanus Casey, all the great spiritual leaders of our time in the last century have always said the basic thing, that God's love for us is there. People question that. It's a very ever-changing world. Is always living in fear of nuclear um, attack and with North Korea and uh, with the scandals of finances and Uh, corruption and everything. The message these great people have given to us haven't changed. If you read Padre Pio, those words are just as strong today that we need to hear than it was when he was saying them. Um, Any of the great saints, St. Augustine, St. even the apostles, the message is the same, that people wander away from Christ and they want to find him, but they have trouble finding him. And to do that, the door is always open they have to come to the door. It's like come to the waters, you know. Uh, the door is always open. But people uh, come with their fears. Will God love me if they know who I really am? People who turned to Padre Pio were fearful of him in some ways because he could see into their hearts. And sometimes those hearts were not very nice. And so there was a fear of, him, of people coming to Padre Pio. And Padre Pio says, you're not coming to me, you're coming to Christ. I'm only his instrument. And so don't, don't come in fear. And I think that's the message of every great person in our century, that the message remains the same. God's love, God's mercy, his compassion is always there. We just sometimes fail to recognize it or want to accept it. Well, once more, thank you always, brother. And you give us great hope, strength, and courage as always. All right. Thank you, John. God bless. All right. Take care.